what we are going to do, we find the dish somewhere. Or we buy a dish that's ready made. We don't have the feed for that dish. And we have to make a suitable feed. This, this, this is the usual uh, work of an engineer. Usually dishes are manufactured by someone else that knows what he's doing, but we should manufacture the feed right for the uh, frequency we have. And what we should understand our this discussion, I didn't mention this before. Uh, you see, with dishes we have a problem with shades. We have a problem with other things that are much worse when the dish is small. So dishes, uh, if we are using a dish antenna, uh, we should uh, think about a large antenna. So uh, the size of the dish, or maybe I can draw it here. Uh, I need not, not read anything. This diameter here of the dish. This diameter of the dish should be larger than 5 lambda. If your dish is smaller than 5 lambda at the frequency where you want to use it, it doesn't make sense. There are other antennas that work better in the same space than the dish. There are other shapes that work better in the dish. So dish is only useful at large diameters compared to the wavelength, so that the directivity of a dish antenna is larger than 20 dBi. For smaller directivities, there are other antennas that are better. In fact, we have it here. Slow wave structures are excellent antennas out to 20 dB directivity. So uh, let's try to use uh, the antenna that's, uh, that actually makes sense for our purpose. For instance, if we had only a 3 lambda diameter dish, the, uh, the, the feed may cover a large part of that dish. And that makes lots of side lobes and little gain. So that's not the way to go. Uh, what can we use as a, as a feed for the dish? Well, as a feed for a dish, we can simply put a, this is our dish. We could put a dipole in front of a metal plate. This is maybe the simplest feed we can think of. So a dipole here. Half-wave dipole, a generator in between here. And uh, some kind of small reflector behind this dipole, so some kind of circular plate behind the dipole. This feed is OK to illuminate a deep dish, so F to D, uh, say in the range uh, between uh, 0 0.3 and 0 0.4. These are deep dishes uh, with an efficiency of perhaps uh, illumination efficiency of perhaps 50%. This is not very good. Why do we uh, obtain this poor efficiency? First, this antenna has lots of uh, side lobes around, and the main lobe is not rotationally symmetric. It has no rotational symmetry, this lobe. So uh, this is not, uh, not, not a good fit, but it works. Uh, say if you have... Uh, uh, a dish with a larger F to D ratio, you could use something like this. This is just, I brought it down as an example. So uh, two full wave antennas here. Uh, so this has already somewhat uh, larger, uh, this has already somewhat larger uh, gain. So this would be appropriate for a dish of 2.6 to 2.7. This is okay to illuminate an offset dish. An off uh, dish you get from satellite TV and use it for Wi-Fi with such a such a primary feed antenna. So this this is this makes sense. Uh, but this is not 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 a good feed. Let let let's make it clear. Uh, the other possibility for such a deep dish is to use uh, at 2.4 gigahertz the coffee can antenna. So here, here the can is closed, and here is the feed, feed probe, and here is the generator. We discussed the coffee antenna, coffee can antenna last time, and in fact this one, you can guess what this coffee can antenna was made for. <laughs> it was made to illuminate a dish because here were the three struts, 
uh, holding this thing in the focal point of the dish. Uh, so with the coffee can antenna, uh, okay, the polarization depends on the point of the feet. Maybe I have a larger can here for somewhat lower frequencies. So this one here, this can, this was 2.4 gigahertz. This is 1.7 gigahertz. Even this one is equipped even with two feeds. You see it has one probe for vertical polarization, the other probe for horizontal polarization. There is some... Uh, some crosstalk between these two feeds. This crosstalk could be reduced by some tuning screws from this thing here. Uh, this thing is round and this thing is round, but uh, it's not particularly good uh, as, a, as a primary feed because this thing will only achieve uh, an illumination efficiency of around 60%. Mainly this is due to the very, very, uh, unsymmetric uh, uh, illumination of this aperture of the of the main mode of the TE11 mode so the TE11 mode has a very uh, uh, very dirty radiation pattern and that's the problem of this feed so here uh, and also we should care about that the cutoff frequencies are quite close so f of T11 and f of TM01 uh, I drew this already, drew already this thing last time on the lectures. Uh, here the constants was 1.8412. This is uh, uh, an extrema maximum of the J1 Bessel function times C0, C0, so speed of light, divided by 2 pi, the radius of the can. And this, uh, the second, the next la uh, higher mode is 4049. This is a zero of the J1 Bessel function. Uh, C0 to PA. So these two are really close together and we do not have much uh, much free play on the diameter of the can because if the can is too small it does not work as a void guide. If the can is too large, for instance if we were using this one at 2.4 gigahertz, this already supports the next higher mode and that next higher mode uh, generates a squint of the main lobe. So this one at the higher frequency will not uh, radiate straightly out, but the radiation will be squint to this side or to the other side of the main axis. So uh, we are quite limited what we can do here. Of course, there are things that we can do better with deep dishes and the figures I was talking about. This is also for deep dish. Also the same the same also applies here for a deep dish, feed for deep dishes. Uh, what is the trick uh, to make things better? Uh, the trick is shown here. It is a feed with a corrugated flange. So a feed that has a circular waveguide in the center and further has this flange with these corrugations around. Also this one, but this one is for higher frequency. This one, this is for 4 gigahertz. This is for 9 gigahertz. Uh, I also have one here. This one was, was for satellite TV for 12 gigahertz, this feed. Of course, the waveguide, the circular waveguide is slightly smaller, uh, but it also has a corrugated flange. Where is the trick here with these flanges? Uh, where is the pen? So we have the waveguide in the center. And then we have this flange that has corrugated grooves around. Uh, if I draw a side view now, so a side view, I just draw the waveguide here. And this is our flange that has one, two, three, four corrugated. Uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, where are the design uh, parameters of this flange? Uh, where is the trick? The trick is that these corrugations are approximately a quarter wavelength deep. So uh, we have a, a short here and after a short uh, after a quarter wavelength, the short transforms into an open circuit here. 
So on top, uh, on the top of the corrugations, we have the condition E tangential equals to zero, here and here. But uh, in, in here and here, here and here, we have yet another uh, tangential condition. And since this short after a quarter wavelength transforms into an open, we have the condition that uh, H tangential, the tangential component of the magnetic field is equal to zero. This is the trick. So uh, the trick with the corrugated feed is to make a surface that behaves exactly in the same way for the electric field as for the magnetic field. That's the reason why this kind of feeds are also called scalar feeds. With such a corrugated flange or maybe corrugated horn if we need more gain for an offset dish, uh, we may make also a corrugated horn. So corrugated horn that's open the horn and now has this corrugation sideways in the horn. Or maybe even open, an open horn, so a horn like this one here, a horn like this one. For even deeper dishes, this has corrugations. But uh, usually for these deep dishes from 0, 4, 3 to 0, 4, it's a flat flange. Usually it's a flat flange. Uh, this, what is the advantage of this scalar feed? The advantage is that it can get with the illumination efficiency up to around 80%. 80% compared to the 60% without the flange is more than 1 dB of a change. Or it is uh, almost 25 dB, 25 percent of the size of the dish. We can get the same gain with a better feed, which is much smaller dish. Or we can get more gain from the same dish with a better feed. That's the trick behind. Uh, so, what do we do for the offset dish? <coughs> The offset dish, as I said, uh, has a, the offset dish requires a feed with a larger gain uh, because uh, it's uh, shallower the dish itself and it requires a narrower radiation pattern of the feed. So we had one reasonable candidate here. But this is not a good candidate. It has many side lobes. It doesn't. This is probably 50 or 60 percent uh, uh, radiation uh, illumination efficiency. Illumination efficiency is not more than 60 percent with this thing. This, this is not very good. But it's a, it's an emergency solution if you have a dish and you make it. So for shallower dishes. What do we do here? Uh, the trick is to use a very special two-mode horn. Oh, sorry, it's not, it's not to scale. Not to scale, should be more in this direction. So we have an offset dish over there. I'm drawing here now in the receiving mode. This. What kind of horn do we use here? And the trick is to use the so-called dual mode horn. I'm trying now to uh, these things. And here we have the circular waveguide that goes to the receiver. This is a solution that is frequently used uh, in satellite TV. We could also use a corrugated horn, but the corrugated horn is more expensive to manufacture than this. Uh, uh, this two-mode horn. How does this two-mode horn work? How does it work? Uh, so, we started a waveguide that only has TE11 mode. Then we increase the diameter of this waveguide, uh, so, that we have a section that has both TE11 and also TM11. 
Tm11 has a higher cutoff frequency. Uh, what we want to obtain at the end, we want to obtain a uniform illumination to have a nice rotationally symmetric beam. And the trick is where uh, Te11 uh, has uh, field lines like this one here. Which are not symmetrical at all, you see, on this picture. This is not symmetrical. While TM11 has something to correct for this. So TM11, if I draw the fields of the TM11 in a dual mode feed, has something like this. And this TM11 is now able to correct. You see, because these two subtract up here and these two subtract up here, you, uh, if you have the sum of both of these modes, you can obtain a much more uh, uniform illumination uh, of, the, of the aperture of this horn. Uh, of course, uh, in order to generate, so uh, with uh, the kind of transition we have here, We can regulate the amplitude of the TE11. T TM, TM1. TM11. TM11. We can, and uh, with the length of this section here, because beta TE, the phase constant of TF1, is not identical to the beta of TM11. TM11 has a larger beta because. Uh, uh, has, a lo has a smaller beta because it's a higher order mode. Uh, we can adjust the phase in between the two. So first we adjust how much TM11 we generate and then we adjust the phase. So these uh, dimensions of this trumpet here are quite critical. But uh, when you got things right, this is actually the commercial solution for satellite TV. I don't have anyone here to show it to you because uh, all of them, we have them on the roof. So next time you have... Uh, exercises on the roof, you, uh, you should look how these things are done. You should look for an example on, on the roof of our laboratory. Because they don't have any here, and they are all on the roof. And they are la pretty large, some of them are pretty large, so they are difficult to carry around. Uh, there is yet uh, another problem with uh, uh, dishes and uh, the problem that generates really lots of many problems is here we have a uh, so this was for offset dishes this is for f to d between 0 6 and uh, 0 7 for offset dishes there is no shade of the feed because the feed is well outside the path of the race here Uh, there is uh, yet another problem we have, and it's the problem of the supporting the feed. So we have our mirror here. But now we have our feed here. This feed, first it needs support rods to the antenna. These support rods will affect the mechanical support will affect the field, and uh, further there is a cable getting out, and also this cable affects the field, so disturbs the, actually the radiated field out of this antenna. How to get rid of this? Well, uh, I have one such idea here. Uh, so this thing gets installed on the bottom of the feed. There is a waveguide connection here. Uh, and uh, there is a so this is the so-called splash plate feed. So the waveguide ends here 
and this is a small reflector to reflect this radiation into the dish. Uh, the guys that designed these things knew lots about electromagnetic radiation. They in fact made even this uh, splash plate here with corrugations. So to keep, keep, it, uh, keep the behavior the same for the electric as for the magnetic field to obtain good dimensional symmetry. So what is the splash plate feed? Uh, it's simply this. So this is my dish. Now I have, for instance, a circular wave guide going through the dish to minimize any reflections and having here a splash plate. Splash plate feed is this called. So that the radiation that comes out of here actually is reflected by this splash plate to illuminate the dish quite evenly. Uh, this field, this feed here, this feed here was actually designed for very deep dishes. So this example we have here was designed for a dish that was almost flush with the uh, surface. So this was for a very deep dish, very deep dish. That one was designed here. So here we had the waveguide. And if we put a conical surface here, and that surface is a little bit conical, we could illuminate also the dish that has a, a very small f to d ratio. So this was made for an f to d ratio or just 0 0.25. If you have an f to d ratio of 0 0.25, what does that mean? It means that 0 0.25, the dish comes that this, uh, uh, the focal point lies, uh, fo focal point is located exactly in the same plane as the edge of the dish. And this was for mechanical purposes, not mechanical, but also uh, practical purposes of this antenna. Uh, so to have the antenna shielded from rain, ice, snow, and so on, is preferred to have this surface here flat. If this surface here is flat, ice will not accum accumulate, snow will not accumulate. So this, this is the trick why this thing is used. Also, that's a partially a purpose of uh, offset dishes. Also, offset dishes, if you look at the offset dishes that are installed on the roofs of uh, our houses, uh, yes, they have a feed here, usually a two-mode feed. Two-mode feed. But that feed is installed in such a way that the radiation now gets out with the correct angle for the satellite. And uh, this surface is quite vertical. Why vertical? To avoid accumulation of snow in winter. That's a very, sim very practical and very important reason why we make it vertical. Not to having snow accumulating on the antenna, because if snow accumulates on a satellite antenna, the, the reception is gone. Uh, but there is a, an important factor I forgot about, uh, about uh, offset dishes. There is also another disadvantage I didn't talk about. If we look at the central ray here, the central ray now comes under the angle theta here or theta here. And the effective surface of this dish, A prime, say, is now only A times cosine of theta. So we lose some surface because the uh, rays do not come at right angle on the dish surface. We lose some of the surface. So this cosine theta is really small. It's not such a big problem, but that's yet another disadvantage. Is we can only use a prime, only the a projection of this, of the surface of the dish on, on our plane wave. So that is yet another limitation. Okay. So now, what can we do about? Uh, what can we do about? Uh, uh, even larger antennas. So for offset dishes, already as I told you, offset dishes have a higher f to d ratio. They require a higher gain, uh, uh, a higher gain uh, 
higher gain here, higher gain uh, feed, primary feed. And also their diameter, if under, in order for, for these dishes to work, their diameter for offset dishes should be larger than, this should be larger than 10 lambda. Or these things should be done for directivities larger than 27 dBi. So um, as you go, as soon as, as you go to more complicated things, uh, the deep dishes could work with 5 lambda diameter. Uh, the offset dishes need uh, a larger diameter to be effective. If we can go to even larger diameters, we can uh, make antennas with two mirror. So, two mirror antennas. Well, the splash uh, splash plate feed was already an example of such an antenna, but this splash plate was uh, splash plate feed was very small compared to the wavelength. This was barely one wavelength of two wavelengths of diameter. If we go to two mirror antennas, we design both antennas as as real mirrors with real geometrical shape. And the large mirror is always parabolic. The larger mirror. We have uh, now radiation coming, say from a satellite here. And these rays now they should join in, in the focal point of this primary mirror. in the focal point here. But we do actually nothing in this focal point. We insert here yet another mirror. And this mirror is an elliptical mirror. And what, uh, what does the elliptical mirror? It rejoins the same waves in the other focal point of the ellipse. The, elliptic, uh, the ellipse has two focal points, so it joins these waves here. And here I can put my feed now, my feed horn. So this arrangement is called a Gregorian antenna. The Gregorian antenna comes, the name comes from, from the Gregorian telescope. Gregory designed these telescopes uh, this 400 years ago, this optical telescope. So it's not really something new. But uh, with the two mirror antennas, we should understand that it only makes sense to use a two mirror antenna if the large uh, parabolic dish has a diameter larger than about 100 <coughs> wavelengths. And the small elliptical mirror, so this was D1, the small elliptical mirror should, uh, should also be large, should be around 10, at least 10 wavelengths. Such two mirror antennas can be built provided that the large dish is large enough. If we have only 10 lambda available here, for, forget the uh, forget the Gregorian antenna. You can you can use a splash plate, but not such a complicated antenna that with real shapes with the parabolic and elliptical mirrors. Uh, there is yet another arrangement uh, that takes perhaps less space than the parabolic mirror. In optical telescopes, it's not, not such a problem, but in uh, uh, radio antennas, it makes sense. In radio antennas, it makes sense to have now, this should come together, this ray should come together in the original focal point of the large mirror. But now, this is a parabolic mirror. Uh, we use here yet another mirror, 
we use here a hyperbolic mirror. Uh, now, how does the hyperbola work? The hyperbola has one focal point here. Uh, so here is the second focal point of the elliptical mirror, F1, F2. F1 is of the hyperbola, and the hyperbola joins this rays in its other focal point, F2 here. And here we have the, the fit horn. So this is called the Cassegrain configuration according to the Cassegrain telescopes, telescope all uh, also developed uh, 400 years ago as a Cassegrain telescope. Uh, we have the same conditions here. So we have D1 of the large mirror larger than 100 wavelengths and D2 larger than 10 wavelengths. So 10 wavelengths to 100 wavelengths, that means that 1% of the big mirror is shaded by the secondary mirror. That's not so bad. If this is 1 to 10 the diameter, then uh, it's 1 to 100 the surface. It's not particularly good shape, but something else can be done. Uh, this horn, here, these feet horns here, we have here, can now be uh, uh, designed to, for a higher gain, but we can also work a lot on the particular radiation pattern of these horns. These are, for, of course, all these horns are corrugated horns. Always corrugated horns are used. So here, corrugated horns like, like uh, this one here. With uh, a much narrower beam, a higher gain, this, uh, these horns may go up to 20 dB of gain because this angle is very low, also this angle here is low. So uh, we can make much more precise illumination f uh, of the main dish. And what is the, with a very precise illumination of the main dish, the illumination efficiency may go up to 95%. So there is an advantage for using these things, provided that we have mirrors that are large enough. So if mirrors are large enough, uh, many things can be done. Usually the problem is when mirrors are small. When mirrors are small, then we have problems. But when mirrors are large, things are much, much easier to do. Uh, a, a, a combination of these two or a small scale version of the, these two is the splash plate feed. We also analyzed. This was a splash plate feed. So this feed is for about four centimeters wavelength. So this is about two wavelengths in diameter. This is not, not yet uh, a Gregorian, although though it looks like a Gregorian, is curved like a Gregorian feed, but it's not Gregorian. This is just a splash plate feed. To make it simple. Okay, what can we do at the other end? What uh, can we do if, say, our distance, uh, our diameter, is smaller than five lambda? Can we use mirror antennas at diameters smaller than five lambda? The answer is yes, but uh, the parabolic shape is not the best one. It's better to build cavities, cylindrical cavities, with uh, carefully chosen dimensions. For instance, if we have such a circular cavity, and we put inside this cavity, we put a dipole, so, so the, the dipole, this is also called a cup dipole, when uh, this diameter here is around 1.2 lambda, with the cap dipole we can get a directivity of around 12 dBi. And this, this is frequently useful. A cap dipole, what I don't have exactly a cap dipole here, but I have a patch put in the in a cavity. A cavity patch, a patch antenna put in the cavity. We are going to discuss patch antennas next time. So again, something I, I don't have really here. Uh, here the cavity is squared. A square cavity compared to a round cavity achieves 1 dB less, uh, less directivity. So with the square cavity, you only have one, 11 dBi of, of uh, directivity out of such an antenna. So this can be done. A patch in a cavity or a dipole in a cavity. 
or a better solution is the so-called short backfire antenna. Uh, I forgot to tell you the dimensions. So the this cup dipole has the diameter of 1.2 lambda. This is actually resonant because this is a resonant cavity and you should keep care here. And uh, this length here is uh, uh, 0.2 lambda, 0.5 lambda, lambda half. A better solution here is to make a larger cavity that's also resonant. Resonant that has a diameter of approximately here, uh, a diameter of 2.2 lambda. lambda. Uh, the rim stays at half lambda. 0 0.5 lambda. We put in a dipole here in this cavity at about midpoint, so this is about quarter lambda. And at another quarter lambda, we have the front surface of this outer rim of the cavity, and we could put here a small reflector. A small reflector that has a diameter of a bind about. 0.7 lambda. And this is called the short backfire antenna. Uh, it is an acronym, short backfire antenna, that uh, has a directivity of approximately 16 dBi. So we have solutions. Solutions below uh, half a lambda, they, they may look similar arrangements to the uh, to the dish antenna, but actually you have no parabolic shear shape here anywhere, anywhere. We have cylindrical cavities here, they are resonant, uh, they only work at this, uh, for these particular values of the diameters. Uh, this one has two reflectors, a short one, a small one, a larger one, maybe similar to this idea here. So this idea here brought down with frequency for very, for very small reflectors. We do not have a parabolic reflector, we have just have a cavity with a rim here. But this is a good solution for 15 d 16 dBi. I have a short backfire. This is the only short backfire I have that has a transparent uh, plate in front, so you can see how it is made. Uh, so this short backfire, then this is, uh, should be lambda half, or here is a little bit over lambda half. This, uh, yes, yes, it is. It is almost lambda half. This, this is lambda half. This is two lambda diameter, lambda half rim height. Uh, large reflector is cylindrical with both rim and bottom side. Uh, front reflector is just a circular disc, and in between is the dipole. Here it's a little bit strange dipole because it's made for circular polarization. But this is actually just a dipole. What is in between here? Feeding this antenna. So we have also other solutions on uh, the other side. Uh, maybe just to make it complete now for this hour, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, I still forgot two antennas to describe. So one antenna, one particularly useful feed, still for dish antennas, I forgot this one, sorry. Before I forgot to describe you this one. Uh, there is yet another antenna very similar to the corrugated flange. But it's not a corrugated flange, it's just, it's just a collar. I will draw this thing up here, so it has a circular waveguide, and it only has one collar around. Only one collar around here. Uh, And this color, if I draw it sideways, it's a circular waveguide and this color. This is the color. So this is a circular waveguide and this is uh, lambda half and lambda half. Uh, this thing can usually be moved back and forth to adjust for the best performance, but use, usually we get the best performance when this thing is flush. Uh, 
This is a, a single corrugation feed, but it has its own name. It's known this as a Kumar feed. Ku, uh, Kumar feed, where this guy Kumar was originating from India. But it's a very good idea. It's a very good antenna. And why it's so good? It's so good because with this antenna, you can actually tailor your radiation pattern like this one. So this radiation pattern has a minimum in, has a slight minimum in the center and maximum radiation here. So this can illuminate dishes very efficiently. So the Kumar feed achieves easily uh, an illumination efficiency of 80% or even higher. So it has a very good, uh, very good efficiency. Uh, this could be used for satellite TV, what, what was not so popular. It's more popular at low frequencies because at low frequencies you don't have the space for all this corrugated. You see, for satellite TV, there's no problem to have several corrugated rings. Uh, this corrugated ring, corrugation rings are already uh, of a larger diameter. This is already putting shade on your reflector, but this one has little shade and excellent performance, this Kumar feed. Uh, it's frequently used by radio amateurs. Um, the Kumar feed now, the only thing, if you look for this in, on Google, has a problem. There's yet another guy, Kumar, also living in India, but he's selling chicken food. When you look for the Kumar feed, you, want, you are not going to get on Google this antenna. You are got, you're going to get uh, advertisements for chicken food. That's the problem. Yes. There is yet another reflector, kind of reflector, uh, that does not have any of these shapes here. It's not parabolic, it's not elliptical, it's not hyperbolic. It's a spherical reflector. Well, why do we need a spherical reflector? There are good reasons to do it. <laughs> if the reflector is so large that we cannot move it, uh, you know that the radio telescope in Arecibo actually collapsed after several, year, several years of negligence and poor maintenance. It collapsed because it was 300 meters diameter and no one took care about it. I don't know what are the Chinese now going to do with their 500 meters spherical reflector. If you have a spherical reflector, what happens with the spherical reflector? A spherical reflector does not have a... Uh, point form fit, uh, focal point. So the rays uh, in the middle, closer to the middle, actually gather up in one focal point, and the uh, side rays actually gather in yet another focal point. So we have a spherical effect. Uh, so, what we actually get here is a focal line. In this focal line, you have to, uh, uh, you have to design your feed so that your, your feed actually matches this focal line. Uh, you may uh, see quite funny pictures of the feeds that were being used in Arecibo to make, manufacture, make this, uh, this uh, this uh, line, f line form focus, focus, not point form, but line form focus. Uh, what is the advantage of this feed? If I move the feed, I can simply move my beam. So I do not move the reflector, I just move the feed. And in the Arecibo, there were three towers supporting this feed uh, close to the focal line of this reflector and moving this feed to move the beam of the radio telescope. Uh, that's the reason because uh, this was 300 meters large. Now, now these things collapsed. So it's a pity we no longer have this telescope, but the, the Chinese built even a larger one. So the Chinese now have the, the working telescope, a radio telescope built along this thing. Uh, these spherical reflectors are sometimes used for satellite TV. Well, for satellite TV, because with one single reflector, you can receive more satellites by putting more feeds. So if you have a feed right here, uh, this feed will actually generate now radiation in the opposite direction, radiation here. 
And if you put another feed here, another feed here, this feed will actually generate radiation in this direction. So you put more feed in such a spherical reflector that so that you get more beams from just one dish antenna with just putting more feeds on it. And this is quite popular in the United States, even in Europe uh, with offset antennas, the errors are not so large if the, if the dish is uh, uh, parabolic or, uh, or spherical. It's quite popular in Europe that you have two feeds here for two satellites. So feed one, feed two, so that uh, uh, feed two actually generates the beam here. So from satellite number two and from satellite number one, you focus this thing in the other feed. If uh, these things are quite close, and in Europe the satellites are located on a quite close section, short section of the arc of the geostationary arc, so this can be done even with simple parabolic antennas. It no need to resort to spherical reflectors. While in the US, where they have satellites, uh, satellites all over the visible geostationary arc, then with such large angles, you need a true spherical reflector and true, uh, true uh, feeds with uh, line. Point. Oh, I hope I got everything now out of uh, uh, out of uh, uh, for the antennas, and we yet have to discuss another subject closely related to what we were talking about antennas. Uh, very closely related, but somewhat different. We also have this on the exercises. I know I'm over time now, but we have next hour we should have the midterm exam and I would prefer to do the break after this exam. After, 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 after I'm finished with all the lectures. So I finish the lecture on this hour. Uh, I, it will take me another 15 or 20 minutes to do this. And after that we have the midterm exam because I lose less, much less time, less time uh, doing this, so I have yet another things to be discussed. And now, uh, as up to now, we always discussed propagation from an aperture to an infinite point, point, point infinitely in space, say in the, uh, beyond the Rayleigh distance in the Fraunhofer region. Now, what happens at finite distances? So we have an aperture at finite distances, and what kind of field we get at these finite distances? Uh, it, it comes together with apertures, so it's still. Uh, a discussion along, around aperture antennas. Uh, but I have to make many drawings here. Hope to be able to make this in 15 minutes. So, I have my sources in the x prime y prime <coughs> coordinate system sources are usually uh, uh, source coordinates are usually defined with a prime mark then at the, at the distance d i have yet another plane this time is uh, x and y and now i have my Huygen source here a Huygens sort that has an area dA. Uh, I don't care about polarization, and this Huygens source actually provides some electric field here. I'm not drawing uh, vector signs because we know that the radiation of the Huygens source is polarization independent. Uh, so here is distance d. I'm going to call this distance r. So what is the electric field over there? this DE I get out of here. The DE. Oh. DE 
is actually the amount. I don't write polarization, I said, is uh, j over 2 lambda. It's uh, uh, the electric field on the aperture, I have here, E0 of x prime y prime, this was on the aperture, uh, x prime y prime. Uh, then I have dA, the size of this Huygen source, the area of this Huygen source. This could be dA, should, I should really write dA prime because it's dx prime dy prime. dA prime. Uh, I have propagation, so I have delay e to the minus jkr divided by r, and I have uh, the radiation pattern 1 minus 1 plus cosine theta uh, for the Huygens source. That's it. Now let's look at this example up, we have up here. And here I choose that uh, both x prime and y prime are much smaller than the horizontal distance d, but also x and y are much smaller than d. Okay? Uh, I'm looking everything close close to the axis d, close to the z-axis. This is actually z-axis. I'm looking at everything close to the z-axis, so what happens then? This is practically equal to 2. Uh, this r in the numerator, uh, in the denominator, r in the denominator is practically equal to d, because that's just amplitude variation. Uh, what we have further up here, uh, so this thing is actually tricky. We should have to be careful about the phase. We should express the phase as accurately as we can. So if I cancel out everything uh, else, so what uh, remains out of this equation? It remains dE is now uh, j over 2, uh, without 2, without the two, j over lambda, because this equals to 2 times uh, d, times d, times d, so that I cancel out this one here, uh, e0 of x prime y prime, uh, a d a prime, uh, and I have e to the minus j k r, and with r I should be careful because phase is the only thing that matters here. Uh, at large distances, fa phase is the uh, most important thing that does uh, happens, and I should express exactly this R now, as accurately as I can. So what can I do with R? I can use the Pythagoras theorem. R is now equal to what? R equals to x minus x prime, the difference in the x-axis squared, plus y minus y prime, the difference in the y-axis, plus d squared, that's the difference in the z-coordinates. Okay? And uh, now I should consider that d is much larger than both x uh, and x prime, y and y prime. So I should uh, really, to simplify this expression, I should try to get d out of the expression. So getting d out of the expression, what happens? d times square root of uh, x minus x prime over d squared squared plus y minus y prime over d squared squared here plus 1. Now making, uh, since both these terms are very small with the conditions we gave, I could simplify these terms, I could simplify by making a uh, uh, simplification of the square root. So if you remember in math, the square root of 1 plus epsilon is, if epsilon is much smaller than 1. Uh, it, uh, the first two terms of the evolution of the Taylor series is 1 plus epsilon half. Okay, we do the same here. So we have the one term here that is just d, plus we have uh, 
x minus x prime squared over 2d because uh, we, uh, we had d squared but multiplied by d is just 2d plus uh, y minus y prime squared over 2d. And now we could evolve all these terms I have here is d plus uh, the first term here is x squared. Uh, okay, I, I will arrange this x squared with this y. So x squared plus y squared, the first term here, the first term here, divided by 2d. Then I have x minus x prime twice. Twice x minus prime divided by 2d is just d in the numerator. Uh, and I have x times x prime. And from here I have y, my, uh, y, uh, uh, y prime and here I mixed up the sign, here should be minus sign. Because I have minus in between here should be minus. And plus the last term I have uh, x uh, uh, prime squared plus y prime squared uh, over 2d. Now I should insert all this in this exponent function here. Uh, let's write the, 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 whole, uh, the whole formula up here. So electric field now is what? DE. No, without the vector sign because we said with, uh, with, uh, with the Huygens source uh, the polarization doesn't matter. It's always transferred. So j over lambda d, we have this in front of it. Uh, so now I will, try, I will try to rewrite these things in a better order. We have first d, d a to the minus j k d, a to the minus e to the minus j k d. Okay. Uh, then I have uh, this terms term here. So exponent function, function uh, e to the minus j k x squared plus epsilon squared over 2d. This is this term here. Then I have uh, the mixed term. The mixed term is here. So I have e to the j k uh, x x prime plus epsilon epsilon prime over d uh, and finally I have the term uh, I'm just writing now the sum in an exponent is the product of the single functions uh, uh, minus jk I ate this sign here because this was minus minus jk is plus jk uh, x prime squared plus y prime squared uh, divided by 2d. I have my electric field on the aperture E0 of x prime y prime uh, dx prime dy prime. Now it is just a matter of integrating to get the whole E here. The whole E will be an integral of the DE, the whole electric field, without the vector sign because uh, uh, it's an integral of DE and it's an integral over two dimensions because I have to integrate over Y and over X. Okay? So now I have to see where do I integrate this DE. I integrate this DE over X prime and Y prime because I have here x, y, and y prime. So which functions go be, uh, under the integral? So this is a function of the integral, this is a function of the integral, this is the function of the integral, y, y prime. Here, I forgot the prime here. While this thing in front is not a function of integration, so I can rewrite this thing in front. So j over lambda d, e to the minus j, k, d, uh, e to the minus j, k, uh, x squared plus y squared over 2d and then I have 
surface integral over two dimensions on x prime and y prime. Here was over a prime of the, of the surface of the source. And I will write first these terms here, these two terms here, e to the minus jk uh, x prime squared plus y prime squared over 2d, uh, electric field of x prime y prime on the aperture. And I will write these two together just to let you notice something. And uh, here I write what is left over. So this is e to the minus jk uh, x x prime plus y y prime over d. Uh, dx dy. So I think we have almost everything here. How to understand this thing now? This is now our function f of x prime and y prime. This is only a function of x y prime and y prime. What happens if I multiply a function of x times a function of uh, some constant? Uh, so let me write this constant here in a little bit different fashion. So this function will be e to the minus j. Uh, let's put this in, inside the constant alpha x x prime plus y y prime okay just just to make, let you understand that that's a constant alpha just a constant and i have here dx prime dy prime or maybe what you did with other professors you called this thing here you call this thing f of t and you call this thing e to the minus uh, j 2 pi frequency times time. And you had here dt. What is this? Integral over t. What is the red integral I have here? How it is called? How did you call this thing? Fourier. This thing was called the Fourier transform. What we have up here, we just have a different constant, but this is just a positive mul multiplication constant. This is k over d, really. And we have everything done in two dimensions. So what we are getting in here, here we have, at this point, we have a two-dimensional Fourier transform. If it were not for these terms here and this term here, if it were not for this term, it was a perfect Fourier transform. What are those terms? These terms are square phased error, square phased errors. How do we correct square phase errors? We have a means of correcting them. We learned about it, even today. We can correct square phase errors with converging lenses or converging mirrors. That's the way to do it. So if I uh, rewrite everything I have here, I have uh, now I'm going to reposition my uh, experiment here. I have here uh, x prime y prime and I have here the electric field prime of x uh, electric field of on the aperture of x prime y prime and I put here a lens a converging lens <coughs> That cancels out this term because this converging lens will have just the opposite sign of what I have here. A 
convergent lens over there. Uh, so I put here a converging lens, and then on the other side. So with this lens, I make this correction. And on the other side, I put yet another lens. Another lens, converging lens. Here with in the plane x and y to get my final e of x and of y. I can rewrite now this experiment without this uh, confusing terms. This, this is one converging lens, and this is the other converging lens. If I make the experiment with the lenses, so this lenses should have a focal length a power. This has a power length of, uh, of uh, d. Uh, focal is d with this lens, and also focal is d equal to d on this lens. If in place of these lenses I put a twice stronger lens in the middle, I can do the same with a twice stronger lens that has the focal equal to d half. So I can, uh, rather than putting the lenses on my source and on my screen, what is difficult, it's much easier to put a lens in this, uh, in the, at the point in between. And I get the Fourier transform without these annoying terms. I only have this and this is a constant. A propagation constant, this is just a constant of propagating the field from this point to field from this point. So actually I go from a plane of here of spatial signal. This signal was spaced into the x, y, and pre prime. I go to spatial frequencies. So I correct my function here of x prime and y prime. I transform it in, into its Fourier transform f of uh, uh, x and y. What is now the way back in the Fourier transform? It's exactly the same except for this sign here. Uh, uh, except for this sign, this changes sign. Uh, so this was uh, not, no, without the minus, oh, here was a mistake. Without the minus sign. Without the minus sign, without the minus sign here, without the minus sign here, I made this mistake. I rewrote it wrongly. Should be without the minus sign over there. Uh, so what uh, the Fourier transform has this nice property that I can back from the frequency space here, uh, uh, so from the spatial frequencies back into the spatial signal. So how do I make the Fourier transform? Uh, maybe I find. Just to describe it here. So I need two lenses, one lens to make the Fourier transform. So this is f is equal d half, it's a twice powerful lens. And I put at d half, I put my object. OK, this is the object. I get the Fourier transform after d half. This is the plane of the Fourier transform of f of x and of y, where I have special frequencies. Then to get back with the Fourier transform, I have to do the same things one, once again. So I have here d half. I have yet another lens with the same uh, f is equal to d half. And uh, after that, I get again my project, uh, my pro object. And where is my project? My project is my object is now here. There is a subtle difference in between here. For the backward Fourier transform, I have to change the sign here. If I want to go back uh, with the Fourier transform, so from uh, big F of x and y back back to F of x and y prime. So if I have here, uh, here the picture I will get will be inverted. OK? Because this inverted sign simply inverts the picture. And in this thing, I can do 
uh, an analog Fourier transform from the uh, space domain to the spatial frequency domain from spatial frequencies back to space. Sounds very easy to process pictures. What happens if my project, uh, my, my object, I make here, I put here at this point, I put here a screen with a small hole. And all the rest is the screen with a small hole. What I'm going to get here, I'm going to get a very blurred picture without the high frequencies. So a picture without sharp edges. On the other hand, if I put in between in the Fourier transform plane just a black dot, then from my original object, what I got out from my original object, now I get out just the, uh, the shape of the object with nothing in between. And you can do easily this in the lab using what? You should not generate spatial frequencies of their own. So uh, the radiation that is coming to this uh, uh, object original should not have any spatial frequencies at all. So what are the requirements now? The requirements for this thing to work is that you have a really plane wave fronts here to illuminate the object. And how do you get this plane wave fronts without any phase modulation? Because if you get phase modulation, you immediately get spatial frequencies over here. You need this a lens and a laser, a collimator and a laser to make this thing happen. You have to do this with laser light and have to avoid any spatial modulation. And this object here should be a transparency. Because with a transparency, you do not have any, uh, you do not have any additional phase modulation because phase modulation on the source immediately generates higher order, higher order, high, high uh, spatial frequencies. <coughs> 